Hello everyone, and welcome to my General Hospital official channel. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before we begin, please hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. Sunny and Diane met at Potsilos, where she informed him that Alexis had been brought in for questioning. Diane gave Sunny a knowing look and stated that she was very certain Alexis had not killed John. Diane revealed that Alexis had publicly threatened John, and Rick and Elizabeth had reported Alexis for throwing a gun from the Blackstone Canyon footbridge. Sunny was furious to learn that Rick was involved. Diane advised Sunny that he might have an alibi for John's death, but Alexis didn't. Alexis put me in an impossible situation. Why couldn't she find another method to get rid of the gun, or come to me? Sunny asked. Diane mentioned that Alexis was her dearest friend and would do anything for her children. Sonny, frustrated, acknowledged that the situation was complicated, but he believed he had control of it. He asked Diane what he was meant to do. Sonny, she was protecting her child, your child, so how do we get her off the hook? Diane asked. Sonny didn't have a quick response, but he requested that Diane keep him informed of everything going on with Alexis. Diane clarified that she could only tell him what Alexis had shared as a friend, not as a client. At Aurora Media, Jocelyn stormed into Michael's office to discuss Carly. Jocelyn was still grieving from the fact that Sunny and Carly had slept together. Michael informed Jocelyn that Carly's sex life was none of their concern. Jocelyn didn't believe Carly had actually had sex. I believe mom has given him an alibi, Jocelyn remarked. Michael attempted to reason with Jocelyn, calling John a garbage human and emphasizing that whoever killed him did the world a service. Jocelyn was terrified when Michael informed her that John had detained Christina and that Alexis was under investigation for John's murder. Jocelyn inquired as to how Michael had mended his friendship with Sonny. It was fairly simple. I realized that hating my father and attempting to distance myself from him cost me more than finding a way to forgive him, Michael said. Michael also reiterated to Jocelyn that they had no control over what Carly chose to do with Sonny. Michael advised Jocelyn to believe Carly knew what she was doing. Carly remained by Lulu's side at the hospital, keeping vigil. Jason soon arrived, so Carly led him into the hallway and explained the situation to Lucky. Jason was not thrilled to learn that Carly had obtained all of her information from Jack Brennan. Jason told Carly that she should keep away from Brennan. Carly claimed Brennan was assisting her, and the only thing that mattered was saving Lulu. When Carly returned to Lulu's room, she asked Jason if he believed she and Lulu shared similar characteristics. Jason stated he'd never considered it before. But I think I can safely say that no one in the world is like you, he replied. Carly told Jason that Dante had confronted her about how she and Lulu had not gotten along in the years leading up to Lulu's coma, despite the fact that they had once been quite close. Carly confesses to missing her cousin and wanting Lulu back. Carly also wishes Bobby was still there for her. She emphasized that Bobby was the glue that held the Spencer family together. Now that she's gone, I feel it's my job to step up, Carly told me. Carly requested Jason to go to Africa and find Lucky. Jason agreed to go and pledged to do everything he could to get Lucky home. Brennan called just then, and Carly prayed he knew where Lucky was. Tracy, Brooklyn, Lois, Lucy, Maxie, and Natalia gathered in the Quartermain Solarium, where Tracy informed them that Deception was in trouble. Tracy was concerned about Sonny's interest in the company, particularly because Sonny was present when an FBI agent was murdered on the Quartermain property. Obviously, Sonny killed him, Tracy said. Natalia explained that it was all guesswork, but Tracy was unconvinced. Our favorite neighborhood mob kingpin could take us all down, Tracy was arguing. Using her more sophisticated accent, Lois stated that Sonny had not been charged and that no evidence linked him to the murder. The ladies were surprised to hear Lois speak so calmly and without a Brooklyn accent. Lucy was even concerned that Lois might be having a stroke. Lois mentioned that she had a dialect coach, but the other ladies had no issues with her accent. Lois defended Tracy, claiming that her former mother-in-law was still concerned by Sonny and Carly doing the boom-boom in her room-room. While Tracy wanted to get rid of Natalia, Maxie defended her and referred to her as a gift because she had rapidly organized Deception's books. 
Tracy advised Natalia ask Sonny to evaluate the morality clause in his investor agreement. Natalia promised Tracy that she would go. Lucy quickly approached Tracy and suggested that she consider hiring a dialect coach to smooth off the rough edges of your tone. Tracy was not amused and instructed Lucy to leave. Tracy went to the boathouse. When they were finally alone, Lois realized Brooklyn was lost in her thoughts. Brooklyn told Lois she couldn't stop thinking about Violet asking her and Chase when they were going to start a family. Lois inquired whether Brooklyn and Chase had ever discussed the problem. Brooklyn stated that she and Chase wanted to have children, but they had no precise plan. Brooklyn was concerned that she and Chase would never agree on timing. Brooklyn stated she was concerned that having a child would be overwhelming. Within minutes, Brooklyn questioned if she and Chase should start trying for a baby right now. How would you feel about becoming a nana sooner rather than later? Brooklyn questioned Lois. Cody met Sasha at the boathouse for the surprise she had promised in a text. Cody peeked over Sasha's shoulder and saw Mac and his family standing there. Sasha prepared a stunning family breakfast for Mac, Felicia, Georgie, James, and Cody. Mac and Felicia invited Sasha to join them. As the family ate, they appreciated Sasha's cuisine. Even James enjoyed the quiche, and he pointed out that Cody had saved him right there. James then inquired about Sasha's frequent overnight stays at Cody's house. Do you think Mom would let me sleep at Cody's? James inquired. Maxie soon joined her family, and James inquired about the sleepovers. Cody acknowledged that he and Sasha didn't have sleepovers. Instead, Sasha might be his girlfriend if she wanted. James couldn't understand why Sasha didn't want to be Cody's girlfriend because Cody's the best. Cody led Sasha inside the boathouse so they could speak privately. I think I would like to be your girlfriend, Sasha remarked. They kissed before Tracy complained about her quiche not being in the kitchen but rather at a brunch by the boathouse. Tracy voiced her unhappiness with Sasha for organizing a luncheon for another family on the Cordomain property. Sasha stated that Olivia had indicated it was fine with her, but Tracy insisted it wasn't Olivia's place. These are my visitors. Tracy, today is my day off, I invited them and paid for the food. Tracy complained to Cody and Sasha that they had gone too far, so Mac intervened and put an end to Tracy's accusations. Mac warned Tracy that no one appreciated a bully. James then offered Tracy his quiche, adding, Mom says I get cranky when I'm hungry, too. Tracy was also termed hangry by James. Tracy declined James' offer and left, but James' family was impressed by how he handled Tracy. In Somalia, Sidwell stated that he was astounded by Lucky's continued poker success. Sidwell stated that he took satisfaction in knowing that Lucky would finally lose, and he could then kill Lucky. Sidwell quickly proclaimed that Lucky's luck had run out, but a goon interrupted them before Sidwell could act on his threat. While Sidwell spoke with his goon, Lucky played the cards to ensure his victory. On the other side of the room, the goon informed Sidwell that diamond mines were running low. Sidwell unexpectedly shot the goon and directed Lucky to seek for the deceased. Lucky rummaged through the goon's pockets and found raw diamonds. Lucky handed over the jewels to Sidwell. Moments later, a goon entered the cell to retrieve Sidwell. After being shackled to the chair and left alone, Lucky smirked as he withdrew a little rough diamond from his sleeve. Jordan sat in Anna's office in Port Charles and told her about apprehending the man who meant to kill Isaiah. Jordan remained determined to discover who the John Doe patient truly was. Anna informed Jordan that as soon as she learned something, she would inform him. Jordan left, and Jason appeared at the door. Anna wondered if Jason was there to gloat about Alexis being a suspect in the John Cates murder case, but Jason had no knowledge Alexis had been hauled in for questioning. Jason couldn't understand why the police believed Alexis knew anything about the murder. Jason explained that he was there since he knew Anna had wanted to speak with him earlier. Anna told Jason that she thought they had formed an alliance and become friends. Jason agreed that they worked well together, and he assured Anna that he had never informed Sonny that Anna had assisted Valentine in his escape. Jason was astonished by Anna's chilly demeanor and begged for one minute to present his case. You're basing your evidence on a missing registered weapon, Jason stated. Anna understood what Jason was attempting to tell her. 
Sonny would never have used a gun that was legally his own to murder someone, is that what you're saying? Anna asked. Jason insisted that Sonny was not foolish. Anna stated that her gut was telling her that Sonny had killed John. Anna received a call and discovered that Isaiah was awake, so she left for the hospital. As Elizabeth attended to Isaiah, he awoke unexpectedly and shouted out the word lucky. When Elizabeth informed Isaiah that he was at the hospital in Port Charles, Isaiah introduced himself and said that Lucky, his friend, had sent him there. He asked Elizabeth if she knew Lucky, which took her by surprise. How do you know Lucky Spencer? she inquired. Before Isaiah could respond, TJ entered the room and informed Elizabeth that she was needed at the nurse's station. Elizabeth promptly called Carly and told her the news about Lucky, unaware that Carly was already at the hospital seeing Lulu. TJ evaluated Isaiah, who asked specific medical questions concerning his illness. TJ immediately recognized Isaiah as a doctor. After TJ had left, Carly arrived and introduced herself as Lucky's cousin. In the corridor, Elizabeth ran into Anna. Elizabeth sent her to Isaiah's room before Jason exited the elevator. Elizabeth informed Jason about her new patient. She was astonished when Jason revealed that he was the one who had found Isaiah. Elizabeth informed Jason that Isaiah knew Lucky, which shocked him. When Anna arrived at Isaiah's room, he described how he had landed himself in Port Charles. Isaiah explained that he was providing medical aid overseas when he met Lucky, who assisted in the procurement of supplies. Isaiah told Anna that he had been kidnapped by a man named Sidwell, a name she recognized. Isaiah claimed that Sidwell was a hypochondriac who had asked Isaiah to be his doctor. After visiting with Isaiah, Anna noticed Jason and Elizabeth outside the room and informed them that they may see Isaiah. Jason insisted on conversing with Anna alone initially. After Elizabeth departed to speak with Isaiah, Jason informed Anna that while he worked with Anna, everything remained between them. Jason also stated that while he worked with Sonny, things remained between them. Anna was dismayed by Jason's refusal to abandon Sonny. Jason stated that he would still like to work with Anna and assist her as needed because he considered her a friend. I wish I felt the same, Anna remarked. In Isaiah's hospital room, he continued his story, revealing that Lucky had attempted to rescue him but became trapped in Sidwell's stronghold. Isaiah explained that Lucky had told him to try to get to Port Charles and contact the WSB. Isaiah also told Carly exactly where Lucky was being held. Carly quickly left to see Brennan after Isaiah told how he had been hit by a car. Isaiah stated that he knew immediately that someone was observing him at the airport. He had rented a car, but when he noticed he was still being followed, he got out and started running. Before he could get too far, he was hit by a car. When Elizabeth visited Isaiah, she disclosed that she and Lucky were once married and had a son named Aiden. Elizabeth was horrified when Isaiah told her that he had never seen Lucky in such distress. Later, Carly appeared at Brennan's office and requested his assistance. I need you to find the exact location of my cousin Lucky, Carly told you. Brennan ran over the information he had provided Laura, but Carly wanted him to be more specific immediately. Brennan agreed to try but couldn't guarantee he'd find Lucky. Jordan proceeded to Drew's office after visiting Anna's. Drew noticed Jordan was distracted by something, so she told him what had transpired in the hospital. Drew was really impressed. Drew also saw that Jordan enjoyed doing police-like job again. Molly frantically contacted Diane from Alexis' living room to inform her that the cops had brought Alexis to the station. When Michael and Christina returned, Molly informed them that Alexis was being questioned about John's death. Molly explained that Alexis had been spotted tossing a gun from the footbridge. Christina attempted to speak, but Michael flashed her a look. Molly recognized Michael's expression as an attempt to keep Christina silent. Molly insisted Christina reveal all she knew. Christina, I am not an idiot, Molly explained. Molly was shocked to find that Christina had visited the baby's burial the night before. Molly felt confident Christina was hiding something, so she departed to speak with TJ. Molly arrived in TJ's workplace and raged over Christina. My mom is at the police station right now, and I think she's about to be arrested for something Christina did, Molly told me. 
Molly informed TJ what had transpired when the cops arrived at Alexa's home. She claimed she could tell Christina and Michael were hiding something. Michael? The same person that gives TED Talks when people aren't honest with him about truth and honesty? Is that Michael? TJ asked. Molly stated that she believed Christina was responsible for John's death based on circumstantial evidence. Christina returned to Alexa's house and questioned Michael why he had not permitted her to tell Molly the truth. Michael insisted that telling the truth would get Christina and Sonny in danger. Christina insisted on doing something to aid Alexis. Michael tried to reassure Christina that Alexis would be okay without her. Christina posed one question. She knew she hadn't killed John, and she was certain Alexis hadn't, but she knew Molly wouldn't believe her. How about you? Why do you believe me? Christina asked Michael. Thanks for watching if you like this video, so please don't forget to subscribe my channel and don't miss any update.